Hi everybody, my name is Ian Engelbrecht and welcome to this video on identifying baboon spiders. I'm part of a team of people that is atlasing distributions of baboon spiders in southern Africa and we've been busy with this project now for about seven years and we thought it was time to give you something showing some of the results that we've got so far. There's also no reliable resource out there which allows you to correctly identify different baboon spider species and so that was our primary purpose in creating this video. We hope that you enjoy it, uh, we'll hope that you'll learn from it, and um, we hope that this will build some more interest in baboon spiders in South Africa and contributing to our work. We have an incredible diversity of baboon spider species in Southern Africa, but there aren't many reliable resources that one can use to get to learn what the different species are and how to identify them precisely. And that is the purpose of this video. It's a preliminary product from our Atlas project and we're hoping that it will help people uh, learn how to identify different species, stimulate interest in these spiders and get more people on board with contributing to the Atlas project. There is a lot of information in this video and it might seem a little bit overwhelming. But just take things at your own pace, watch the video at a speed that you're comfortable with Make notes while you're going along. You might not remember everything the first time around, but you can go through the video again. Uh, talk to your friends that are also interested in baboon spiders. And also, um, what I suggest is practice with your new skills, your new identification skills with identifying records on the Virtual Museum and iNaturalist. If you enjoy this video and you like what we're doing with the Baboon Spider Atlas project, please subscribe to the channel like the video and share it with your friends. So just to give you some background, the Baboon Spider Atlas is a project that we started in 2013 with the goal of mapping baboon spider distributions in Southern Africa. When we started this project, we thought it was going to be relatively quick and easy to do it. We had the impression that baboon spider taxonomy was relatively well resolved. We knew what the species were and we just needed to produce decent distribution maps for them. Boy, did we have it wrong. We've learned a tremendous amount since then. We've discovered that there are many undescribed species out there. And in many cases, the distributions were completely unknown. So it's been an incredible project up until now where we've learned a tremendous amount. So this is the landing page for the project website. Um, it tells you how you can get involved in the project um, by contributing specimen records that you see from the wild. It has a section on what a baboon spider is with a little uh, um, subsection for each of the genera of baboon spiders. And then it shows some information about, then it has frequently asked questions and, show, and shows who's involved in the actual project. The study region for this project is Southern Africa. On this map, you can see the coverage of records that we've managed to accumulate so far. Um, this is a large number of records contributed through the ADU Virtual Museum uh, by citizen scientists, um, but it also includes published records from the literature and records from museum collections. So our focus region is Southern Africa. Uh, Southern Africa is typically described as um, the, the, the northern border of Namibia, um, the border of Zimbabwe and the southern half of Mozambique, but we're extending our interest a little bit further than that to include the northern part of Moz Mozambique, Malawi, Zambia, and Angola as well. The other thing that you can see from this map is where we have records and where we still need new records from. So in South Africa, you can see Lesotho is standing out. We've got these areas in the Northern Cape where we have no records. Um, Namibia, very few records on the eastern side of Namibia here. Namibia is particularly poorly sampled. Botswana, also not very well sampled. And here you can see just how few records we have in Mozambique. Basically a few records in the south, a few records from the coast, and, um, and, and, and basically the rest of the country being empty. Similar story for Angola, very, very poorly sampled in Angola. Um, the central parts of, of, uh, Zim of Zambia we have records for, but very little in western Zambia and then on the eastern side of Zambia, very little too. So still plenty of work to uh, fill in all of these gaps. 
So how can you get involved in this project? Well, it's quite simple. What we need is for people to be photographing baboon spiders in the wild and submitting those records to our project. If you want to submit a record to us, you can visit the website, you go to this menu item at the top that says get involved and click upload the record. And that takes you to our record upload form. It's a very simplified form for submitting records to the project. You simply enter your details, your name and email at the top here. If you were with someone else or with other people when you saw the specimen, you can indicate their names as well. Very important is to indicate the date that you saw the specimen. And we included these little convenience buttons on the form where you can say you saw it yesterday um, or today and it automatically fills in the date for you. And then the key information is where you saw the specimen. And here you have the option of adding geographic coordinates. If you recorded coordinates on a GPS or on your phone while you were in the field when you saw the spider, or you can use this handy Google map to find your location. It has a little marker on it. You can drag that marker around on the map or you, um, we advise that you zoom in as far as you possibly can on the map to find the exact point where you were and then drag that marker um, to that location or double click on the map to move the marker automatically. You'll see that when you move that marker, it automatically fills in the coordinates at the top and it goes and it fetches locality details for that location. So it'll tell you you are in South Africa, it gives you a distance, and a direction to the nearest town and then it makes an effort to try and come up with a sensible locality name for where the location where you saw that spider. The next thing to do is add the photographs that you took for the of the specimen. You can add up to three photographs in total so you can click on this little panel here to open up um, a, a file selection window and you can navigate to find your files like that or you can simply drag and drop a file from a folder onto that window. A little spinner pops up while it processes the image and then it shows you the image that you've just added. Please just make sure that spider map is selected from this drop down list here. Uh, this form is submitting records directly to the ADU Virtual Museum database. Um, and you can actually use it to, to send records to other ADU projects as well, but um, we're wanting spider records to go to spider map, of course. And then lastly, in this notes section, you can add any uh, notes of interesting behavior or how you found the spider or anything else um, when you actually saw it. And then you end off by clicking this little submit button at the bottom of the form. Please note though that baboon spiders are protected in Southern Africa. And we don't encourage people to remove them from the wild for any purpose. Uh, photograph the spiders where you see them, leave them in place, and submit the records to us from there. Right, the last matter of order before we get started with identifying baboon spider species um, is to thank all of our contributors who've submitted records to our project. We really would be nowhere without the incredible contribution that the citizen scientist community has made in submitting records. Through this effort, we've actually managed to assemble the largest database of baboon spider records that exists. I would also like to thank Taki Tsonis, one of our collaborators on the project, for the incredible photos that you're going to see in this video. A special thanks must also go to Nadia van Sael and the late Ethne Engelking for the incredible work that they've done in sourcing records of baboon spiders from social media for this project. Um, again, this has been a significant contribution to what we've done um, and, and absolutely invaluable in terms of building our database. And lastly, I would like to thank the team at the ADU Virtual Museum for supporting this project and providing the platform that we can use to build our distribution records. Okay, starting off with the genus Orgocephalus. These are what we call the golden brown baboon spiders. And they have this very typical sort of orange coloration or, or orange brown coloration to them. Uh, very, very distinctive uh, spiders, basically unmistakable. Um, one of the key features with them is that they have black, very dark black coloration 
um, on the underside of the cephalothorax and on the underside of the first two pairs of legs and pedipalps. And that black coloration is fringed by a distinctive row of CT that separates it from the, uh, from the orange-brown coloration on the rest of the leg. So I'm just going to show you here in this image what I'm talking about. So these are some figures from um, a paper by Gallen in 2010, um, which included redescriptions of several um, baboon spider species. And, um, and he included these really nice images of the undersides of different species of Orgocephalus. And here you can see what I'm talking about, this really distinctive black coloration on the underside, this black coloration on the inside of the leg here, and this fringe of CT um, that separate that black from the rest of the from the rest of the coloration on the outside of the leg. Um, now, interestingly, this is a feature that Orgocephalus share with um, several of the uh, horned baboon spiders, the Keratogyrus uh, species as well, and uh, could point to a um, relationship between the two genera. Uh, Orgocephalus live in vertical burrows in the ground, and they have this really distinctive turret on the entrance of that burrow made out of uh, little stones and bits of grass and other plant matter that the spider kind of pulls together to build that turret. Um, the juveniles actually have um, bigger turrets than the adults very often proportionally to the size of the spider and um, I've actually seen how the juveniles sit on the top of that turret at night and um, wait for prey to come walking past and they'll pounce off that turret to catch things uh, walking by. Um, this is a, a photo of uh, Orgocephalus brayeri in its burrow. And here you can see that really strong orange coloration on the front legs nicely. And I think what we're seeing here is actually um, demonstrates the purpose of that orange coloration in that it's um, potentially some kind of flash coloration that the spider has um, that could scare off uh, pr uh, potential predators that come sniffing around in this burrow to see what's in here. So that orange coloration is most distinctive when it's viewed from the front uh, like this, and, um, and it can be really quite striking. Just to have a look at, this, at the distribution quickly, uh, this here shows the distribution of the genus in southern Africa, and uh, I'll talk about the, the distribution of the different species um, when we get to them. But the genus is primarily distributed throughout the bushveld and lowveld parts uh, of, of the northeastern part of South Africa, and, um, and it sort of uh, spills over into eastern Botswana and southern Zimbabwe as well. Okay, so starting with the species that people see most often, this is Orgocephalus junodi. Um, it's the bushveld golden brown baboon spider. Um, and the way that we recognize the species is um, females are really large. They're really big baboon spiders. Um, but if you have a look at the front legs, the front legs have got this really broad appearance to them because they've got these dense rows of CT here on the sides of the legs, um, which give the, those, those front two pairs of legs a very broad um, appearance. So that's um, one of the key features. Again, in this figure from the paper, um, these, are, these are the exuviae or the shed skins of the different species. Um, you can see here how Junodi has these very broad front legs compared to um, uh, Brayeri, which is the other species we get in South Africa, which has much narrower uh, front legs. So um, that's the key feature that you use to tell these two species apart. But there are other features you can use as well. This is a figure from Gallen's 2002 revision of the genus Pteranoculus, where uh, Orgocephalus was given genus level status on its own and taken out of Pteranoculus, um, where it had been up until then. And uh, we want to have a look at this figure here, figure 69. And um, this is a lateral profile of the spider's cephalothorax. Um, so it's showing the chalicera, the carapace, and the underside of the sternum and the coxae. Um, so there are two important features here that we use to tell the two species apart. Um, and in Genodi, what we see is that the cephalic region, this anterior region of the carapace, um, dips down slowly towards the fovea, which is over here, 
and it kind of gradually slopes down into the fovea. So that's important, and you'll see the difference when I show you Brayeri in a second. Um, also important here is um, this uh, is the underside of the spider, and it's showing the hairiness of the sternum and the and the coxae of the leg. So basically, the you can think of it as the spider's chest. And um, in Genodi, the hairs are basically short um, on the chest of the spider. Uh, this spider in the photo here is an adult male Orgocephalus genodi. So um, something that's very distinctive with the species is that the males are tiny. They're literally a fraction of the size of the females. They mature very, very young, which is why they're, they're so small. And um, this, this, uh, these mature males have several important features for the species as well. The first one is that they have no tibial spur on the front legs, no spur at the end of the tibia here that the male uses to engage with the female's mouth parts. He's simply too small to actually engage with her mouth parts, uh, with her chelicerae in any meaningful way during the mating process. Another important feature with the males of this particular species is that the pedipalps are proportionally quite large in relation to the size of the spider overall. So even though, even though the total body size of these males is much reduced, he still has relatively large pedipalps because he has to mate with this female that's so much larger than him. Lastly, the males of this particular species are active in autumn. So here we have the distribution range for Orgocephalus genodi. Um, it's, uh, it occurs throughout the sort of northern parts of what was the old Transvaal, so now northwest province, Limpopo, and the northern parts of Mpumalanga on the low felt. Um, there is this single record here in northern Namibia, which was published in that revision by Gallen 2002. However, we are now quite certain that that was an uh, erroneous record as a result of a mix-up with specimen labels in the collection that that specimen came from. So taking a closer look at the distribution range, you get them in Gauteng province, uh, just north of Pretoria and the Michalisberg mountain range, and from there heading further north, basically up to the Limpopo River. Um, you also get them in the northern parts of the low felt over here, down to about Timbavati um, before um, Brayeri takes over further south than that. Uh, we do also have this single record from um, eastern Botswana. We've also got a record in southern Zimbabwe, um, but we're not 100% sure whether those records are of Genodi or not. Um, the spiders are much smaller than we typically see for Genodi, and um, there are some other differences. So we need to get adult males of those before we can be sure what those records actually are. Okay, so moving on to Brayeri. As I mentioned earlier, the key difference is that Brayeri has these much narrower front legs than what you see with Genodi. Overall, the spider is also a little bit smaller than what we typically have um, for Genodi. And then coming back to the images from the 2002 publication again, this time the images of Brayeri, you can see those other differences on the cephalothorax I was talking about. So in Brayeri, the, the, the cephalic region drops down suddenly into the fovea as opposed to Genodi where it gradually um, descends into the fovea. And then the other really important difference is that Brayeri has these long CT on the underside of the cephalothorax, these really long hairs on its chest. If you can get a specimen into a jar and have a look at the underside, you'll see that uh, quite distinctively. So we don't have any images of male Brayeri yet. We haven't been able to get them ourselves through the project. So we're going to have a look at some records on the ADU Virtual Museum, which is a really great place to see images of the different species. Um, so I'm going to, this is the, the Virtual Museum homepage. I'm going to click on Spider Map, and that brings up this search window over here. And when I want to search for a particular species, I click on this tab at the top that says by scientific or common name. 
And this is really handy because you don't have to type the full scientific name of the species in here. You can just type parts of the name in order to bring it up. So I'm going to type AUG org space BREY and that brings up the species which I select and then I click on search to bring up all the records for that species that we have in the atlas. Scrolling down here I'm going to this record submitted to us by Alison Fitzgerald. The specimen was uh, um, collected near Kamatipurt on the low felt and um, I'm going to open up this image. So the first thing about the males of Brayeri is that they are large. They are um, the same size proportional to a female as we see in most baboon spiders. The leg span is basically the same as what a female's leg span is. The males are obviously much more slender and leggy than the females are. Looking at the second photo uh, where the male's got his legs a little bit more spread out, you can just make out over here on his one leg that he has a tibial spur. So he's got well-developed tibial spurs on his front legs and um, which he uses when mating with the female, which the males of Junodi do not have at all. The males of Brayeri are also active uh, in autumn, as is the case with Genodi, um, although in both species we do sometimes get males active in, um, in early spring. Going across to the distribution of this species, you can see it's primarily on the eastern side of South Africa here, close to Swaziland. So here's the close-up of the distribution. And you can see southern part of the low felt, so it's the southern part of the Kruger Park, um, around Marloth Park, um, sort of east of Nelspreit, and then south through the eastern part of Swaziland to these two records that we have, in, uh, which are on the border of Swaziland, the southern border of Swaziland. And quite likely that the species just gets into this northern part of, um, of KwaZulu-Natal province, uh, near Jazini Dam. Um, it also extends eastwards into Mozambique um, where we have a handful of records as well. So just scrolling out again to the distribution as a whole within South Africa. The third species of Orgocephalus is Orgocephalus ezendami and I'm showing you the images here of the species from the paper where the male was described and um, and the female and well and the species moved into the genus Orgocephalus from Keratogyrus. This species is presently only known from material collected from Mozambique and sent into the pet trade in Europe without any specific details on where it comes from. Um, it's more or less intermediate between Brayeri and Genodi, so the front legs are a little bit thicker than in Brayeri, but not as thick as in Genodi. It also has long hairs on the, on the chest, but not as many as what we see in Brayeri. And um, unfortunately, because Mozambique is so poorly surveyed, we don't actually know anything else, out, anything else about the species. But that's hopefully one of the things that we'll be able to get to in future, is more comprehensive surveys in that country, and we can find out where the species exactly uh, comes from. Moving on to the genus Brachianopus, the pygmy baboon spiders. These are the smallest baboon spiders that we have in southern Africa. The name Brachianopus means short foot, and that is actually the key to identifying these spiders. It refers to the very short, stocky appearance of the first two pairs of legs of these spiders. They really do have short, compact legs compared to compared to other baboon spiders. And overall, the appearance of the spider is quite uh, compact. They are most similar in appearance to the genus Harpacterella, but can be separated from that genus based on distribution in large part, uh, with the exception of Harpacterella overdeki. Brachianopus occurs mostly in the eastern parts of southern Africa, whereas Harpacterella is primarily in the western parts of southern Africa. The exception to that is, of course, Harpacterella overdeki, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, 
and I'll show you where that occurs and what the distribution is. The taxonomy of Brachianopus is unfortunately very unclear at the moment. Uh, there are several species described. I think it's about six described species, um, but they're all described on the basis of females, and most of them were described based on single specimens in the early 1900s or late 1800s. So um, the genus has never been revised, and from what we can tell, it's actually quite diverse, and uh, there, are that there are probably many species in this genus waiting to be described. The other important thing about these spiders is that they were thought to be members of the, of the family Barry Kelly Day for a long time. So a completely different family of spiders to the baboon spiders and tarantulas. This has also led to confusion with the identity of these spiders in Zimbabwe, where it seems like they are particularly widely distributed and common, but I think they are being identified as Barry Kellids. And so you'll see when we um, look at the distribution range, um, there are virtually no records in Zimbabwe except for these records collected in the Eastern Highlands. However, we're fair, fairly certain that it occurs throughout uh, Zimbabwe and in Eastern Botswana as well. Because the taxonomy is messy, we're only going to look at two species uh, for, this, um, for this documentary, and uh, those will be uh, Robustus and Pretoriae. So we're not entirely sure what Robustus is. The spider in this image here is um, what people are currently calling Robustus. Um, it's a very uh, 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 stocky species of Brachianopus. Within the genus Brachianopus, it is particularly stocky, um, and uh, which is what gives it its name. Another important feature about the species is that it's dark in color. They tend to be black or dark brown or dark gray. Um, those sorts of colors. So um, quite distinctive in terms of its coloration. Another important feature for identifying Brachianopus, and particularly, particularly the males, is they've got these very spiky back legs. So the back legs have got these uh, very distinct spines on them, and they've got lots of those spines. So most baboon spiders have got spines on their legs, but Brachianopus is the only ones that have these kind of almost prickly uh, back, back legs that you can use to recognize them. The species is often seen in KwaZulu-Natal province. It occurs through Swaziland and onto the low felt as well. So quite a wide distribution. Um, and as you can see from this map, relatively commonly seen in KwaZulu-Natal. But here's the catch. The species was originally described from East London. And we don't have any new specimens. We don't have any males in particular that we can compare to males that occur further north to actually confirm that they are the same species or not. Um, what we do have from the Eastern Cape is a single record from further inland of a, um, uh, of a female, and we've got records from, uh, uh, from Cape St. Francis near Port Elizabeth. Um, they do look to be robustus, so it is possible that it's all one widely distributed species that occurs from the low felt all the way down to the Port Elizabeth area. Um, but we definitely need more sampling in the Eastern Cape to see whether um, these spiders from these different regions are in fact all one species. Just to take a look at the male quickly. Uh, this is a male specimen over here, and again you can see the, the very dark coloration, basically completely black um, in the species, and, um, and again quite a stocky appearance for a male baboon spider. The other species that we're going to look at is Brachianopus pretoriae. So this species was described from Pretoria, and we've done quite a lot of surveying around Pretoria, and it seems like it is quite distinctive and, um, and, and an easily identifiable species. So this species is brown. It's got a kind of um, mouse brown coloration to it. The starburst on the carapace is indistinct. And again, it's got these kind of, um, these kind of short, stocky legs that are distinctive uh, for the genus. Looking at the male, 
Um, you can see that it's a little bit more leggy than the males of uh, Robustus. Um, very, very similar to a Harpacterella male and um, quite different to tell them apart, actually. But again, indistinctive um, starburst on the, caris, on the carapace and this sort of um, quite distinct light brown color that these spiders have got. Looking at the distribution of Pretoria, we can see that it occurs in northern Gauteng province and the adjacent parts of neighboring provinces. Um, importantly, again, there are lots of Brachianopus records elsewhere in surrounding areas, um, but those, as far as we can tell, are um, different species. And in Gauteng province in particular, south of the Mahalisberg and its associated mountain ranges, appears to be a different species of Brachianopus. So an interesting, uh, um, it's an interesting group of spiders that needs a lot of work. It's been quite neglected, um, but um, it, like I said earlier, it looks like it's particularly diverse and, um, and in need of a lot of attention. On to the genus Keratogyrus, or the horned baboon spiders. These are some of the most distinctive baboon spiders that we've got in southern Africa. And the name refers to this protuberance or horn that sticks out of the fovea in the middle of the spider's carapace. These spiders tend to be brown or gray in color, and the shape of this horn varies from one species to the next and can be used as, an, as a feature for identification. Looking at the distribution of the genus, it occurs throughout the, the northern parts of southern Africa. So um, the northern parts of South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, into Zambia, and Malawi. The first species we're going to look at is Keratogyrus atonitifer, an absolutely unmistakable species. These photos that we have here were provided by Chad Keats, who photographed live specimens during an Okavango Wilderness Project survey in Angola after the species was described. The species is dark in color with these kind of golden fringes to the carapace and, and on the legs. But the absolutely key feature is that it has this massive horn in the middle of the carapace. There is no other species of spider in the world that has a feature like this, making the species um, unmistakable. However, we still have not got males of this particular species, and so we don't know what the males look like and whether they have a horn like this at all. Next is Keratogyrus brachycephalus. This species is absolutely distinctive, having this horn that faces forwards on the carapace. Also, the horn is very, very large uh, in the females in particular, making it quite distinctive. So when viewed from above, the horn of the females of this species is very large and very broad in relation to the rest of the carapace. So this is a photo of a male of Keratogyrus brachycephalus, and it shows quite nicely the beige coloration of the species. Again, the horn, you can't quite see it in this image, um, but it is pointing forwards, a little bit smaller than in the female, but again, very distinctive, and the species can't be confused with anything else. This is the distribution of brachycephalus. They occur in the northern parts of Limpopo province, into the eastern parts of Botswana, southern Zimbabwe, and interestingly enough, into this area of Mozambique, just south of Malawi. Um, the species is definitely better collected in South Africa than it is in Zimbabwe and Mozambique, but more collecting will probably yield records that connect up all these different areas where the species has been recorded. This is Keratogyrus darlingi, probably one of the most commonly seen and widespread baboon spiders that we have in southern Africa. They tend to be a gray color like this, sometimes light gray, sometimes a darker gray, but the key identifying feature is the horn in the middle of the carapace, which sticks up at more or less a 45 degree angle backwards out of the fovea. So quite a distinctive species, um, it also has these white markings at the bases of the patella, so, so it gives the impression of having white knees, um, but, but the shape of this horn is uh, distinctive. Uh, this is a male over here. 
uh, lighter in color than the previous uh, female, um, having been collected from a different area. But again, the horn pointing back from the carapace, um, a relatively large horn, but not as large as we see in some of its uh, relatives. As I mentioned, the species is very widely distributed in southern Africa. It occurs through the northern parts of the old Transvaal, um, now northwest Limpopo and Mpumalanga provinces. It's in Mozambique. It extends into northern KwaZulu-Natal. Um, it's uh, uh, been recorded in Zimbabwe, throughout Botswana, and into the northern parts of Namibia. Of particular interest are these records here from the Khalakhari Transfrontier Park in the Kalahari. Um, they were supposedly collected by Lamoral, who was an arachnologist working at the Natal Museum uh, during, a, during an extensive survey of the park in the 1980s. However, we haven't had any other records from that area. We've had no photographic records despite the fact that there are many tourists visiting that park and um, there, there might be a question as to whether there wasn't some kind of error with um, when these records were captured in the database for uh, that particular museum. So something that needs to be investigated there. All right, Keratogyrus dolichocephalus. This is a Zimbabwean species and at the moment it's something of a mixed bag or a catch-all species which includes what looks like a range of different things and we're not really sure what's actually going on. So we have spiders like this from central Zimbabwe, gray in color. We also have something like this which is much more yellow from southeastern Zimbabwe. What people are also including under the name Dolichocephalus is spiders that look like this from further north in Zimbabwe. Um, they all have a horn in the middle of the carapace that points backwards. However, it's not as well developed as what we see in Darlingi. And also, quite importantly, it takes a little bit of uh, uh, time to learn to recognize, but it looks almost as though this horn it has been poked out of the carapace by somebody sticking their finger into the underside of the carapace. So the lines from the carapace extend onto the horn, which is quite different to what we see in Darlingi. In Darlingi, the horn is a complete entire structure on its own in the middle of the carapace. So the angle of that horn can be similar to what we see in Darlingi, although, as I said, not as well developed, or the horn can be sticking out backwards from the carapace, as in this form from southeastern Zimbabwe. This is again that other form from northern, well, northern and central Zimbabwe. Again, quite a distinctive horn, but quite broad. And again, these lines from the carapace extending up onto the horn. Now, the males don't have a horn at all. That's something that's important. Instead, they have a very deep U-shaped fovea on the carapace. It's almost as though the horn hasn't grown. It's like it's there, but it hasn't actually grown. So this is the spider viewed from above, and this is that same spider viewed from the side so that you can see that there's no actual horn on that carapace. So this is the distribution. Um, it's throughout most of Zimbabwe. We have quite a large number of records for it, but as I mentioned before, we're not really sure if this is all actually one species or not, and um, it needs to be investigated to see what's going on. Keratogyrus marshalli. This is one of the most spectacular species in the genus. They're very large spiders, and they have an incredibly large, well-developed horn in the middle of the carapace. The distinctive thing about this species is that in the females, the horn is almost vertical. It goes almost straight up. It is also quite variable in that in some populations, the horn actually leans forward. Um, so it varies from being slightly backwards to slightly forwards. But the key thing is having this really large horn that sticks up almost straight up from the carapace. 
Males, remarkably enough, have almost no horn on the carapace whatsoever. They're very similar to males of Dolichocephalus, except that instead of having a strongly procurved fovea, they've got a little, almost like a little plug in the middle of the carapace where the horn would be. So that's how you recognize males of the species. The males and females are actually so different that um, they were originally described as different species. And it took some time before people worked out that it was actually a male and female of the same species. In this image, we have an immature male. And you can see here how the horn is underdeveloped in the immature males. And it remains so through to adulthood. Whereas in females, the horn starts to progressively develop in the juveniles. So even in relatively small juveniles or, or half-grown juveniles, there's already quite a large uh, horn in the middle of the carapace. Looking at the distribution, the species occurs primarily in Zimbabwe, but it also occurs in the central parts of uh, Mozambique as well. So um, it doesn't have a particularly large distribution occurring from Harare and surrounding areas uh, into Mozambique. Um, there are these two records over here which look like outliers, but they are actually valid records for the species, and it's possible that it's more widely distributed in this part of Zimbabwe as well. The next species is Keratogyrus meridionalis. This is a particularly interesting member of the genus in that it has no horn on the carapace at all in either sex. There are also a few other things which I'll show in a second which make it quite unique. But overall, these spiders are gray in color. They've got a, an indistinct starburst on the carapace. And overall, the, the appearance uh, is quite distinctive for the species once you, once you get to recognize it. This is the underside of the spider. And what's interesting about this is that it doesn't have a black underside on the abdomen as other Keratogyra species do. So it's got these pale bands over the book lungs like we see in other Keratogyrus, but the rest of the abdomen is relatively pale. Something else that's unique about it is that the um, inner surfaces of the first two pairs of legs in the pedipalps don't have the distinctive black coloration that we see in other species separated from the color on the outside of the leg by that distinctive fringe of CT. So quite a distinctive species this uh, overall. This is the male over here. Again, quite dark gray in color. And what stands out about it is that it's got these white bands on the legs, these, uh, these what we call the white knees. And again, the indistinct starburst pattern on the carapace and absolutely no horn in the middle of the fovea. The species occurs primarily in Malawi. Uh, the type locality is here on the border of Lake, Lake Malawi. It occurs through to southern Malawi, and we actually managed to get a record for the species in Mozambique, just south of the southern border of, um, of Malawi. It's also been recorded in this northern part of Mozambique, on the other side of Lake Malawi, um, but overall it seems to have a relatively distinct and limited distribution in that part of the world. Keratogyrus paulsoni. This is another species of Keratogyrus that doesn't have any horn on the carapace whatsoever in either of the sexes, males or females. The species has quite a distinct color in life. It's sort of a a silvery gray color. Another key feature about this species, which you can just make out in this photo, although it is a little bit blurred, is that the front legs, when viewed from the front, have got these dark margins on the outer edges. So it's quite distinct when you see the spider in life in that the, the lighter leg coloration contrasts quite strongly with that dark coloration on the outsides of the legs. And so when you view the spider from the front um, and its legs are all grouped together, you kind of get this like light and dark striped appearance, which is, which is quite distinctive, um, particularly when you see the spider sitting in its burrow. Males are very similar to females in overall appearance and coloration and are active in autumn, uh, as is the case with many other Keratogyrus as well. The species is uh, recorded from 
only one locality in the Kruger National Park. Uh, from a conservation perspective, it is probably the species that most needs to be protected um, in southern Africa because it has only been recorded from one locality. Um, we have surveyed quite extensively for additional localities um, but have not been able to find the, these spiders anywhere else. So it may be that the spider is, uh, that, that this particular species is very range restricted. Okay, Keratogyrus sanderi. Uh, this species again has a distinctive horn shape. In fact, they don't have a horn at all, but instead they have something that looks like a little plug, a little rectangular or triangular plug in the middle of the carapace. Um, they tend to be uh, light brown in color, maybe through to light gray, um, but the color is relatively uniform. This specimen here is, um, has a slightly different coloration to the one that you saw previously, which was from Botswana. This specimen is from Mozambique. And also you can see the shape of this plug in the middle of the carapace is not quite as rectangular um, as the previous one. This is the male over here. Um, also with that plug in the middle of the carapace. What's interesting to note here is you can actually see the similarity between this species and Brachycephalus uh, if you compare the, the photo of this male to the Brachycephalus male that we looked at earlier. And we actually think that the two species might be quite closely related to each other, um, but we need to investigate that in more detail. But they can't be confused because Brachycephalus has that distinctive horn that sticks out of the fovea in both sexes, whereas in Sanderi, it's either a little plug or only barely sticks out of the carapace, um, as in this, uh, this specimen here. Now, the distribution of Sanderi is quite interesting. Uh, the species was originally described from Namibia, and as you can see, there are many records in northern Namibia over here. But then we have this group of records up here in northern Zimbabwe. Um, during the course of this project, the species was discovered in Botswana as well, and we, we managed to get some photographic uh, records through the virtual museum also. And, um, and it extends into Mozambique, and it's even been recorded in southern Malawi. So for a while, we weren't even sure whether these two populations were connected. However, we do have this one record in uh, the Caprivi Strip in northern Namibia, and this apparent gap between these two parts of the distribution range is probably a result of undersampling in that area. So more surveys in that area would probably produce more localities that eventually connect those two populations up. But again, this is a big distribution uh, for a baboon spider to have from Malawi right across to northern Namibia. Okay, the last two species that I want to talk about in the genus Keratogyrus are Keratogyrus pelanzi and Keratogyrus hilyardi. Both of these are a little bit problematic and we're not actually sure what the species are. Pelanzi was originally described from uh, Rhodesia, the locality says Rhodesia, but it was collected at the time that Rhodesia included both Zimbabwe and the eastern part of Zambia. So it's really not certain where the specimen was collected. Um, there was another specimen that uh, was attributed to the species at the time, which was collected, I think, close to um, Mutare in Zimbabwe. Um, but the original specimen described was a juvenile, and that second specimen was a male. So um, we also can't be sure that they were the same species. What makes it even more problematic is that that original specimen uh, has been lost. So even though the description includes some pretty uh, distinct features that are, that are quite clearly described, um, we can't actually work out what they are referring to without seeing the specimen. So unfortunately, um, it's, it's going to be really difficult to work out what Pelanzi is. And in fact, um, it might be relegated to a status of nomen inquirendum or something like that, which basically means we can't work out what this particular um, species name actually applies to in the wild. The second one is uh, Keratogyrus uh, hilyardi from southern Malawi. Here, 
the species was described from specimens collected around Zomba, and uh, we're going to need to have quite extensive collecting in that area to collect new material, both males and females, so that we can compare them to Meridionalis, um, which occurs in the southern part of Malawi as well, and see whether it is actually a, dis a different species or um, perhaps just a local variety, or, 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 or perhaps it could be something completely different as well. Um, but yes, until, until that's done, until we have new material from the original type locality of, Z of Zomba, um, we're not going to be able to work out exactly what, um, uh, what Hilyardi is. The next genus we're going to look at is Harpactera. Uh, these are the so-called common baboon spiders, even though that's not a particularly good name for them because they're often not very common. Uh, you don't see them in the same sort of high abundances that we get um, other types of baboon spiders like horned baboon spiders or, or some of the Harpactorella. Um, they can often be quite rare um, at a particular site, um, but we don't really have a better uh, common name for them. So, um, so these tend to be small to large baboon spiders. Um, the colors tend to be quite drab, various shades of brown or gray or black, um, with one or two exceptions where the species are brightly colored. Um, this is another example here, a, a brown colored species. But the diagnostic feature for this particular genus is uh, the scopulae on the chalicerae. So if we have a look at this specimen here, which has been photographed from the front, and you zoom into the photo, you can see the scopulae, these sort of brushes of hairs. They look like a, like a brush cut almost on the outside of the chalicerae. Uh, most of our big uh, baboon spiders have got those. But Harpactera also have a brush of CT like that in between the chalicerae. That is the diagnostic feature for them. Um, we don't have any other baboon spiders that have got uh, these uh, uh, scopulae on the outside and on the inside. Um, if we take a look at this specimen here, you can see them all also nicely. It's a slightly different angle. Here you can see that uh, scopula on the outside of the chalicera there. And here you can really see these nice uh, scopula CT between the chalicerae. They kind of face each other um, in, between the, in between the mouth parts. So that's, that's the um, diagnostic feature. Um, other than that, though, just looking at the animals, at these animals superficially, uh, they can be easily confused with, um, with the genus Pteranoculus. Um, and also the smaller species can be confused with um, Harpactorella and Brachianopus. And, um, and you do unfortunately have to look quite carefully to see those features, particularly on photographs. For telling these apart from Harpactorella, it's um, the size and uh, the chalicerol scopulae that, uh, that you have to look at. Um, Brachianopus tend to be much, much smaller than any um, of the Harpactera species. They've got the name pygmy baboon spiders for a reason, and they also have those very stocky legs, uh, which you can use to separate them from Harpactorella. Harpactera occur in a range of habitats, a wide range of habitats, including Fainbos, savanna, and we even get them in some pretty arid uh, desert environments. Having a look at the distribution of the genus quickly, this is what we have for them so far. They are, the genus Harpactera is predominantly limited to South Africa, uh, with a few records in Namibia. They're probably in the southern sort of two-thirds of Namibia, and then you get them in southern Mozambique. Um, as well, and we've even got a record as far north as uh, Inyamban in, in Mozambique um, with nothing in between, but it is plausible that they go that far up uh, in Mozambique. And uh, the center of diversity for these spiders seems to be down in this uh, sort of Cape Floristic region. That seems to be where we have the most uh, species. So definitely a very strongly South African uh, genus, this one. Starting off with Harpactera atra, or commonly called the black baboon spider, which is a common species down in the, Western, in the Western Cape. This is a medium to large baboon spider species, tends to be all black in color, or uh, black or dark gray with a, with a dark brown abdomen, um, but overall a very darkly colored species. Um, the large adult females and adult males tend to be 
completely black, uh, which, is, which is distinctive for them. Um, importantly with the species, it is quite stocky, and um, the legs are relatively short compared to Harpactera marxi, which is often confused with the species. And we'll show you the, deep, the, the differences between the two um, in a second. It only has uh, subtle white markings on the leg joints, um, subtle or, or, or absent. Um, and another key feature for it, which I'm going to show you on a virtual museum record submitted by Lorenda van Breda, is that in the adult males, they have these reddish-brown hairs on the abdomen, um, a very, very distinct feature for this particular species. Something that's really interesting about the species is that the males, like the one in this photo, uh, walk during the day. So most of our baboon spiders in southern Africa are nocturnal. The males come out at night and go wandering in search for females. But we have many, many records for this particular species submitted to us uh, where the spider is actually photographed walking around during the day. And I've also found a male walking in the day. So that seems to be a common uh, behavior and an unusual behavior for this particular species. The males are active from early spring through to early summer, from, so from about August through to November or December. Um, and the distribution is um, quite discreet. This is the overall distribution within uh, South Africa, tucked down here on the west coast. And if we zoom into that in a little bit more detail, you'll see the species basically follows the west coast from around Irlands Bay all the way down onto the Cape Peninsula, and then it tracks the, east, the, the, the western edge of the Hottentots Holland Mountains, and we even have a record as far north as uh, Tilbach. Um, so very, very common around Cape Town. We have lots of records every year that come in from Cape Town. Um, people see them there all the time. It's often seen in suburbia, and so we get uh, images like this with specimens imaged on roads, or uh, in people's houses uh, quite commonly. Um, another species that this might be confused with is um, the common lesser baboon spider species that you get around Cape Town uh, and up the west coast, which is Harpactorella trilevenae or Harpactorella helenae. Um, you'll see when we, when we talk about those two a little bit later. Um, but that's also a black or dark brown baboon spider species uh, that occurs down on that Cape Peninsula and up the west coast. Um, but the two can be differentiated on size quite easily. Um, being lesser baboon spiders, they're much smaller uh, than Harpactera atra. Um, the males also don't have the red hairs um, on the abdomen. Um, and again, the key feature that you would use to actually tell them apart definitively is the scopulae, uh, these scopulae on the chelicerae, which Harpactera atra has and Harpacterella lack completely. Okay, the next species we're looking at is Harpactera marxi. And this is a very similar species to Harpactera atra, also occurs in the Western Cape. People get them mixed up all the time, but they're actually quite different to each other. Marxi is, uh, tends to be more gray in color than what, uh, than what atra is. Um, it's more gray or more brown. This photo here, this photo here gives a nice overview of the female. Um, you often see this kind of spotty, these spotty markings on the abdomens of the females as well. But the key difference between these two species is that the males are much more leggy and slender and elongate than what Harpactera atra males are. So this is a male that we've got over here, um, and he's got these uh, more distinctly elongated slender legs. Also with the males, they have these white, these more distinct white markings on the leg joints, uh, which stand out quite distinctly when, um, when you're identifying them in photographs. This is a record of Harpactera marxi from the Western Cape, submitted by, by Ian Malcolm Reisdijk. And again, in this photo, you can see that distinctive gray coloration that the species has. And even in the females, you can see that they're generally uh, more leggy, elongate spiders than what Harpactera atra is. This is a record of a male that was sent to us. 
by Cherise van Nikerk. And again, if we look closely at that image, you can see that the spider's got a slender appearance to it, as well as having those distinct white markings on the legs. The two species also differ in their distributions. So this is the distribution that, that we have for Marxi. So if you look closely at the distribution, you can see this species occurs more inland than what Atra does. Atra is limited to this west coast region, and as I said, it tracks the western side of the Hottentots Holland Mountains. There is an overlap in the two species in this area here. So um, from Tilbach down to about Paul, we do get records of both species, but further north is all Marxi following these mountains. This species can also be particularly abundant in those areas. It seems to like rocky areas and uh, it lives under rocks. You often find them in little, uh, in silk retreats under rocks. So um, it seems like there might be some kind of um, habitat specialization going on or, or habitat differentiation going on between the two species and, um, and that driving the distribution, uh, the difference in distribution. The, the northernmost record that we have for Marxi is uh, Neuvotville, but it might even track those mountains a little bit further north as well. Staying with the Cape group of species, this is Harpactera chrysogaster. Um, it's actually one of the more brightly colored species, having uh, this bright orange abdomen, whereas the rest of the spider is, uh, is dark gray or black. Um, the, the immatures have these sort of lighter color, colored hairs all over them, uh, which is also quite distinctive. Um, but this bright orange abdomen is what the key identifying feature for this species is. So uh, down in the Western Cape, dark colored spider with a bright orange abdomen is always going to be, um, is always going to be Chrysogaster. Um, interestingly, we don't have that many records for the species in the atlas. We only have uh, 12 records submitted to the virtual museum so far and a handful of records uh, in, in collections as well. So it's not a species that's very well collected or seen particularly often. Um, to have a look at the male, we're going to have a look at this uh, uh, record submitted by Alan Hills and colleagues um, of an adult male that was seen again um, indoors or, or, or close to a human building. And again, you can see that nice orange abdomen and then all the features typical of male baboon spiders, the more elongated legs, modified pedipalps, etc., etc. But this is a very distinctive species and it basically can't get mixed up with anything else. This is the distribution, again, down in the Western Cape. And if we zoom in on that, you'll see where it occurs. So this species is on the western side of the Hottentots Holland Mountains and onto those mountains as well. It seems to have quite a distinct, uh, discrete little distribution down in the Western Cape. Most of the records that we get through the Virtual Museum are around Stellenbosch and, uh, and Somerset West. That seems to be where it's most, uh, most commonly seen, um, but it does occur a little bit more widely than that as well. The last member of this Cape group of Harpactera is Harpactera caffreriana. We've nicknamed these the coppery baboon spiders. And from this photo, you can get a sense of why we've called them that. The distinctive feature for the species is that they've got this coppery color or even a bright orange color to them, which no other baboon spider has. So this is a female in the image here. You can see this coppery coloration on the femurs of the legs. It's on the chelicerae and it's on the carapace. Another important identifying feature for the species, though, is that this coppery coloration on the carapace comes right up to the eyes. It does not have a black mask around the eyes like we see in other species. And I'll show you some examples of that in other species shortly. The males of the species are absolutely beautiful. We think one of the most beautiful species that we've got in the country. They are bright, bright orange, orange on the body, orange all over the legs, the mouth parts, and uh, the pedipalps as well. So again, absolutely cannot be confused uh, with anything else. Adult males of the species are typically seen in autumn. 
um, but we also have records in um, in November. So perhaps something similar to what we see in Harpactera chrysogasta in terms of its activity. The distribution of the species, like the others down in the Cape, is distinct and discrete, occurring down here in the Southern Cape. And if we zoom in on that, we'll see we see that it occurs from around Caledon across to sort of Riversdale area. But interestingly, and uh, you'll see why I say that later on, it doesn't seem to occur south of these Bradars Dorp mountains here. It's only north of the mountains here at Bradarsdorp. So nice discrete distribution. Importantly though, most of the geographic area where the species occurs has been converted to various forms of agriculture, primarily wheat farming and canola farming. So much of the natural habitat in that area is gone. And that might have implications for the conservation status of the species. The next group of species we're going to look at is what we've called the Namaquensis group. This is also a largely cape-based group of, of uh, Hopactera. Um, they share a number of features, which, um, which is what we think makes it a particular group of species. And the first one that we're going to look at in that group is the spider on the screen here, Hopactera dictator. This is one of our largest, most impressive baboon spider species that we have in South Africa. And the distinguishing feature for this species is this uniform beige or light brown color throughout the spider. They also have some black markings on the carapace and the abdomen, but overall this is a uniform beige spider. Another important identifying feature for Dictator is this black mask that it has over the eyes over here. I mentioned that uh, species like um, Caffreriana don't have it, but it's a very distinctive feature um, in the species and always a good thing to look for when you're identifying uh, large baboon spiders. This is a male specimen over here, um, again with the sort of typical leggy appearance that we see in the males, but also that same uniform beige color throughout, uh, throughout the specimen. Males of the species are typically active in autumn um, and people sometimes see them crossing roads. Um, there are one or two cases where people have seen males active in relatively large numbers. Um, so they can be quite abundant in some areas. Like many other Harpactera species, these spiders live in burrows in the ground, um, sometimes under stones as well. Uh, this is a photo sent to us by uh, Ryan Tippett, um, where he got a photo of a really nice large female um, sitting at the burrow entrance. Here you can see the burrow just behind the spider. Interestingly, no turret or anything like that um, on the entrance of this burrow, but you can see the silk around the entrance um, indicating that a spider is actually occupying that burrow. As I mentioned, this is one of the largest baboon spider species that we have in Southern Africa. And we had a fantastic record submitted to us by Patricia Blacklaws that really shows this nicely. In this photo, you can see she had this spider in her shower. And this is her hand on the glass, on the opposite side of the glass to the spider, which gives a nice perspective of how big this particular species can actually get. This photo, this photo also shows one of those features that I mentioned, um, which makes us think that, uh, that this Namaquensis group is a phylogenetic group, and that's the curvature on, this, uh, on the metatarsis of the first leg in the male, um, where the, 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 the segment is curved downwards, and it's got this kind of bulge on the underside towards the end, um, quite a distinctive feature in this group of uh, Hopactera species. She also submitted another photo of the specimen against the glass. And in this photo, you can see, again, that really nice, distinct, uniform uh, beige coloration. The males of the species are typically active in autumn, um, and that's when people are seeing them. They can be abundant in some areas. We do have cases where people have said they've seen several males crossing, crossing the road at night. So the species can be abundant in certain areas. 
Harpactera dictator has quite a distinct distribution in South, in South Africa, occurring down here in the Southern Cape as well. And if we zoom in on that distribution to see uh, the details, we can see this, that the species occurs from around Worcester and tracks the mountains east of that down into the Southern Cape and as far across as Oatshoorn. These records here, um, the, the, the easternmost records we're not 100% sure of. Um, we actually have records of Harpactera tigrina coming in from the eastern cape here. And um, the two species appear superficially very similar. Um, these are photographic records, so we can't actually examine the specimens under the microscope to see, if, um, to see which species they are. Um, the two species are distinct. If you, if you do look at them under a microscope, it's very easy to tell them apart. Um, but superficially, what we're seeing in photos, um, it's, sometimes, it's sometimes hard to know which one we're looking at. But definitely in this area here around, uh, uh, around Oatshoorn and heading westwards from there is all dictator. All right, Harpactera baviana. Um, also a favorite species of ours, actually, and uh, quite a distinctive species, but something that people um, often misidentify. This is a photograph of a female that I have on the screen here. It's a, a dark brown species with kind of um, light coloration on the carapace and the legs. Um, an important feature of it is that the, the femurs are light in color and the rest of the leg is relatively dark. Uh, in color, but overall um, a dark brown, a dark brown Harpactera species. This is a male specimen over here, and it actually happens to be a topotypic male. What that means is that it was collected at the type locality for uh, the species in the Northern Cape. So actually a very important specimen because it allows us to confirm the identity of this particular species. However, this male was already quite um, uh, tattered and, and worn when we when we'd found him. We think he was quite an old male. So he'd already lost a lot of the coloration on his carapace um, that, is, that is distinctive um, for the species. But again, what you can see in this photo, um, the Namaquensis group feature being this downward curved metatarsis on the first leg with that little bulge um, at the base on the inside. This is a fresher male. This is actually a, a male that matured in captivity. And here you can see it's got this sort of indistinct starburst pattern on the carapace, uh, which is one of the uh, key identifying features for the species and what actually allows us to distinguish it from Harpactera namaquensis, which is the species that it gets confused with quite a lot. So this was a nice male specimen um, that we have in this in this. Uh, in this photo here. So I mentioned that the starburst on the carapace is a, is a key identifying feature for the species, but it does have other features which, se which separate it distinctly from Namaquensis. Um, the shape of the, of the mating bulb on the pedipalps is important, but you need to look at that with a microscope. And it also has differences in the shape of the eyes, um, but also a feature that requires a microscope to see. However, um, overall, the appearance of this animal is quite different to Namaquensis once you get your eye in and are able to recognize the two species. Uh, lastly, the males of this particular species are active in, uh, in, in autumn and into winter. Having a look at some of the records submitted to us on the Virtual Museum, we can see some more um, identifying features. This is a record from the Northern Cape uh, sent to us by uh, Franz Pretorius, and um, it's of a juvenile specimen. And if we have a look at this photo, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. If we have a look at this photo, you can see again in the juveniles, this coloration on the legs is quite distinctive. Pale, uh, sort of almost yellowish in this case, uh, pale yellowish femur, uh, similar in color to the, to the carapace and the abdomen but then the ends of the legs being darker um, brown or gray in color. Um, very distinctive uh, for this particular species.
And here again, uh, an absolutely lovely record sent to us by Zenobia van Dijk. Um, also, this one from the Eastern Cape, uh, this time a female specimen, an adult female specimen. And the females also have this indistinct starburst pattern on the carapace, uh, distinct for the species. Um, as I mentioned for Dictator earlier, here you can see that nice black mask around the eyes, which is a valuable identifying feature. Looking at the distribution, it has this uh, uh, um, sort of elongated distribution here in the central part of South Africa. It's basically on the eastern edge of the Karoo biome. That's where this uh, species occurs. Um, from around Kuruman in the Northern Cape, all the way down to Willow Moor in the Eastern Cape. So actually quite widely distributed. Harpactera namaquensis. Another one of the very large, impressive species that we have in South Africa. Females are very similar to Baviana females in overall appearance, but the patterning on the carapace is slightly different, and the legs tend to be much darker, almost black in this species, as, a com as compared to the brown legs that we see in Baviana. As I mentioned, the two species can be difficult to tell apart in the females, um, but with some time and practice, you begin to see the differences between them quite distinctly. Uh, the, feature, the key thing with Namaquensis, though, is that you're typically looking at a spider with a pale carapace and dark legs. That's the key identifying feature. This is the same specimen viewed from above. And here, again, you can see this pale coloration on the carapace and the abdomen and these nice, distinctly dark legs contrasting with that. Here is a male specimen and in the males that distinction between the light carapace in the body and the dark legs is even more marked. So in the males you typically have this very pale carapace, no distinct starburst pattern at all on the carapace, as well as a light colored abdomen uh, and these dark legs. This particular species can be huge. And here again, we have a really great record submitted to us by Donovan de Swart, um, where they got photos of a specimen on their hand, and that gives you an indication of how large these spiders can actually get. Um, definitely amongst the largest that we have in southern Africa. Males of this species are also active in autumn through into winter. This is the distribution of the species. And you can see that it occurs throughout the Nama and most of the succulent Karoo biomes as well. So this is basically in the central and western part of the Karoo biome, whereas it seems like Baviana occurs more on the eastern side of the Karoo biome. Uh, these records over here, um, we're not sure about. Those, um, those may be misidentifications, um, but we also think that there might be some overlap um, between the two species on the edges of their distributions. The last species we're going to look at in this group needs no introduction. It's the blue-legged baboon spider, Harpactera pulcripes. This species is absolutely unmistakable. It has bright yellow and blue legs. There is nothing else in the world that looks like this, actually. So, um, it's an absolutely distinctive uh, species and probably our most beautiful baboon spider that we have in the country. This photo is of a juvenile submitted by Richard McGibbon to the Virtual Museum and it shows really nicely that uh, contrast and coloration on the, on the legs. The juveniles tend to be more brightly colored than the adults. They tend to have brighter yellow and brighter blue um, on the legs. However, when these spiders mature, they tend to lose the brightness of this coloration. So this is an adult female in the photograph over here, and you can see she no, lo she no longer has that bright yellow coloration. It's re replaced instead by a, a light brown or, or beige color, but the females do retain the nice blue coloration uh, on the legs. The males also lose their bright coloration when they mature. So this is a male in the photo here. And again, you can see the light brown 
body, the light brown femurs on the legs and pedipalps. The remainder of the leg no longer has the distinctive blue coloration that we see in the females and juveniles. But it becomes more of a gray color, but is still quite distinct and makes these spiders um, very distinctive to, to identify. Um, interestingly, this species was described from juvenile specimens collected near Grahamstown in the late 1800s, and it's, and it's never been described. The adult has never been formally described in the scientific literature. Because there's such a high demand for the species in the pet trade, we're not actually going to show the distribution um, on, on the map as we have done for other species. Um, it is important that... Um, uh, locality records for, for species that are sought after um, in the pet trade and, and where um, over-harvesting or, or poaching might be a threat to that species actually do need to be kept hidden. Um, however, the species is basically limited to the Eastern Cape province and has quite a restricted distribution range. So Pulcrapes was the last member of the Namaquensis group that we looked at. We're now moving on to a different group of spiders and into what are actually the taxonomically problematic species within the genus Carpactera. The first group we're starting with here is um, the group that includes three species. Um, it's Harpactera curator, Harpactera guttata, and Harpactera tigrina. And here we're not actually sure whether there are three different species or if it's all one species that's been given three different names uh, by different authors. So the species has, um, well, these three species are, are distributed in the eastern part of South Africa. Um, they cover quite a, a wide geographic area and there's quite a lot of variation in color and, and patterning within these spiders, but it doesn't seem to be consistent. Um, and what, what, what is consistent across them is the, is the shape of the mating bulbs in the males. They've got a very distinctive mating bulb, and um, all three species seem to share the same mating bulb shape. So we're really not sure if they are different species. Um, this is a female over here of um, Tigrina. Um, it has a relatively distinct starburst on the carapace. And again, the spider is a sort of a beige or, or light brown color. This is a female from a different area. The starburst on the carapace is less distinct in this particular individual, but again, just a uniform um, brown color. This is a record of curator submitted to us um, by Monique Alston. Um, the specimen was seen in KwaZulu-Natal. And here again, you can see it's overall a, a uniform brown spider. Um, it's got some uh, indistinct starburst markings on the carapace, um, but nothing particularly distinctive about it. The last one we're going to look at is Guttata, with this record from East London, submitted by Andrew McLeod. Um, actually a very fat specimen, and, um, and again, sort of a... Um, a uniform brown or perhaps grayish color um, in this particular specimen. Um, one of the things that we think might be unique to this particular form or species is that the starburst consists of relatively distinct, very thin lines on the carapace. That's what the specimens from around East London look like. But we're really not sure if, um, if it is actually a distinct species or not. Um, in this case, um, the female has this really large, really fat abdomen um, because it was actually a gravid female um, that was seen for this, for this record. If we have a look at the males of these spiders, um, this is a male over here. It has a relatively distinct starburst on the carapace. Again, uniform light brown coloration. This is another male specimen, and in this case, a less distinct uh, starburst on the carapace but again, brown in color. So really uncertain about the boundaries between these forms. The other important thing to note about Harpactera guttata is that the name has actually been relegated to the status of nomen dubium in the literature. Um, the reason being that the type specimens from East London were, were lost 
um, during the Second World War when the, when the museums in Germany were bombed. So it's not actually possible what, to work out what the name Guttata refers to. So it's no longer considered a valid scientific name. If we look at the distributions, the distributions are um, a little bit misleading in a way because we're basically identifying specimens based on where they're found. So if specimens, if the specimen comes from KwaZulu-Natal or the northern part of the Eastern Cape, we call it curator, and that's what the distribution looks like. If it's from around East London, we identify the specimen as Guttata, in which case that's what the distribution looks like. And basically everything else gets identified as Tigrina. However, if you look at the distribution of all three species together, you can see it forms a really nice contiguous distribution range, um, which is leading us to think that perhaps it is all just one species. Um, but interestingly, it spans a whole range of different habitat types. So these records here in the Eastern Cape are in the Karoo, and then the records up here in the northern part of the distribution, this St. Lucia record, for example, is actually in um, subtropical coastal forest. So the species occupies a whole range of different, um, of different habitats, or this group of species occupies a range of different habitats. Definitely something that needs some more research. The next two species we're going to look at are Harpactera hamiltoni and Harpactera gigas. Uh, these two species occur up in the northeastern parts of South Africa. This is a nice female gigas that I've got on the image here, um, here on the screen. Um, the reason that I'm including these two species together is because this is, again, another taxonomic question. We're not 100% sure whether these are actually two different species or just one variable species. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. The two species are very similar um, in coloration overall. They're basically a dark chocolate brown color with paler hairs on the legs. Um, sometimes the margin of the carapace is a little bit paler, paler as well, but it's basically a dark brown spider. No distinct starburst on the carapace at all, um, and the carapace tends to be dark. What's interesting with these spiders in particular is that the females seem to get darker as they get older and larger. So young, relatively small females are, are, are a lighter shade of brown, but really big old females can, get, can, can almost be black. They get so dark that they're almost black. Um, but yeah, just very, very dark brown spiders. This is a male gigas in this photo here. These guys can be really large, this particular Species can be really large as well, again, amongst our largest baboon spiders um, and the same size as things like Namaquensis or Dictator. Um, you can see his nice little calliceral scopuli really nicely in this, in this photo. Um, the males are lighter in color than the females. Um, they can almost have a bit of a golden coloration to them, um, which, is, which is quite distinct. And then these darker leg segments, the last uh, sort of the last two segments of the legs tends to be a little bit darker in the species also. And then here is a photo of a female Hamiltoni, okay? Um, it is quite similar. Um, and actually, it seems as though the main difference between these two species is size. So Gigas are uh, larger spiders. Um, there's also a difference in the distribution range, although um, it's a little bit fuzzy. But typically, Hamiltoni is about half the size um, of Gigas. What we see in young Hamiltoni specimens as well, you can see it nicely on this image, is this kind of golden, these golden CT that they have on the carapace, the abdomen, and, um, and, the, and the femurs of the legs. So they can have a, a golden appearance to them. Um, some people say that, that if you look at them in the right lighting conditions or, or individuals from particular populations almost have a greenish uh, tinge to those hairs as well. But the base color of the spider is still a dark brown um, with this golden and, and paler CT on the legs. And here we have a nice photo of a male Hamiltoni. Again, quite similar to the male Gigas but just a lot smaller. 
Um, you could describe Hamiltoni as a medium-sized species, whereas Gigas is definitely a large baboon spider species. So, what is the key identifying feature for these spiders? So back to this photo again, and you can see the clue to identify these species. So if you look at the second last segment on his first pair of legs here, you can see that it's curved sideways. This is different to the Namaquensis group, which um, where I said earlier, in, in males of Namaquensis group species, the metatarsus is curved downwards and it's got a kind of bulge on the underside of the leg. In Hamiltoni and Gigas, uh, it's curved sideways. Um, it's only the first pair of legs, obviously. This is a modification uh, for, uh, that's, that's used in mating with the females. Um, obviously, we have the tibial spurs on the, on the segment before that. And basically, that curvature of that segment um, wraps around the female's chalicerae uh, when the males are mating with them. But the curvature is different uh, in the different species. And in this one, it's curved sideways. And we see that in Gigas and Hamiltoni. Here's a really nice virtual museum record that shows this particularly well. Uh, the record was submitted to us by Yolandi Ulsen, uh, and the specimen was seen in Mpumalanga province. So if we have a look at this specimen here, it was photographed on a light um, background, probably a wall, but here you can see really nicely this curvature and then the bump, it's got this really distinctive protuberance on the inside of, this, of that leg segment um, towards the end of the leg segment. Here again on this segment, you see the curvature and that bump on the inside. Here is a, a close-up photo. Um, it's slightly out of focus, but here you can see this really nice uh, tibial spur over here and the curvature of the segment with this large sort of bulge uh, that we have towards the end. So, here's the thing, right, is that there do, there do not seem to be any uh, consistent morphological differences between Hamiltoni and Gigas. And like I said, we're pretty much only using size to, to tell the two species apart. We're also using distribution to some extent as well. And if we have a look on the map here, this is what we have as the distribution of gigas. So quite widely distributed, occurring from the Sotpansberg Mountains up in Limpopo province, and it follows the Drakensberg. It actually gets down onto the low felt as well. You get them in the southern half of the Kruger National Park, and it extends all the way into northern KwaZulu-Natal province as well. Um, you get them in Swaziland, and you get them in southern in southern Mozambique. Um, they're pretty much they're pretty consistent throughout this range, except for the those from the Mozambique and northern KwaZulu Natal coast, which sometimes have a kind of grayish color to them. However, here is the distribution of Hamiltoni, right? So Hamiltoni is in Mpumalanga province, very widely distributed in Gauteng extends through northwest province almost all the way to the Botswana border. Um, I'm pretty sure that you'll get them in, in um, Botswana um, if you survey in the right areas. Um, through the Free State all the way down to the southern parts of the Free State bordering, um, bordering with the Eastern Cape. Um, we have one record in Lesotho. It's probably more widely distributed in Lesotho as well. Um, we also have records here in central KwaZulu-Natal, and you would have seen there are records from that same area for Gigas uh, also. There's no consistent point where you can say, this is where Hamiltoni stops, and that's where Gigas starts. And if we plot the two species together, just like we saw in the Tigrina curator Gutata group, it's a relatively uh, a continuous distribution range for these two species. So again, something that needs more investigation, um, and my feeling is that ultimately these are probably the same species, and they just vary in size across their distribution range. In, in both species, Hamiltoni and Gigas, they have a very distinct activity period with the males active in autumn.
that's when we seem to get the records for males of these guys. So that's it for the described species of Harpactera that we're going to look at. The last three described species which I need to mention are those names that you see here on the screen, Harpactera lineata, curvipes, and lyrata. And these are three species that we basically can't resolve what they really are um, without seeing the type specimens and uh, comparing those to existing material. This is the description for Harpactera lineata. You can see described from a female only, and, um, and the only information that we have here is that the spider was collected from South Africa. So no detailed information on where it comes from. Um, the species was described in 1897 uh, by Pocock at the British Museum. And unfortunately, there just isn't sufficient information in this description to actually work out what species he was talking about. We have a similar situation with the next species, Hopactera curvipes, described in the same paper, also described from a female. And again, very, very brief description. The only thing that stands out in this description is this here about the, the metatarsis of the fourth leg being distinctly curved and uh, convex internally. Um, the locality is Natal, which is, we know that Harpactera curator occurs in uh, Natal. Um, we've also seen specimens of Harpactera Hamiltoni slash Gigas from Natal. So um, it could be a deformed specimen of one of those. Um, and again, without seeing that actual specimen, uh, we, we, we can't work out what this name is. So, so we're, we're basically treating these names as nomen inquirenda for now. So here is the last one, uh, Hopactera lyrata, uh, interestingly originally described as in its own genus Planodecta, um, but again, unfortunately not enough information in this description to, to say what species that's, this actually is. And the locality simply says South, America, South Africa. So um, not something that we can resolve without seeing the specimen. Just to end off Harpactera, we're going to take a look at a handful of the undescribed species that we've learned about during the course of this project. Uh, starting off with this one here. It's a relative of Harpactera caffreriana. Um, also occurs down in the Western Cape. Um, but it is easily distinguished from Caffreriana in that it doesn't have that distinctive coppery coloration on the carapace. Um, the, col the lighter coloration is more of a, um, a beige. Um, but again, you can see, as I said, for, for Caffreriana, the coloration comes right up to the eyes on the carapace. Um, and there's no distinct ocular mask. Uh, these are medium-sized baboon spiders. Um, and are actually really pretty. We, we think it's one of the prettiest baboon spider species that we've got in the country. I'm going to use a virtual museum record submitted by Mike Fabricius to show what the male looks like. And um, the males are particularly pretty. Uh, this is him over here. He's almost got like a, a light sort of cherry blonde appearance to him. Um, but also quite distinctive is that the tarsi are very dark in color relative to the rest of the to the rest of the leg and again here on the carapace you can just see his eyes poking out from behind his leg with that nice um, sort of pinkish blonde color going right up to the eyes and here is the distribution very narrowly distributed down in the western cape and if we zoom in on that the species only seems to occur south of the Bredasdorp Mountains and the Klein Refirberg Mountains from around Hermanus down to Agullis. So a very discrete distribution in that region, separated from true Caffreriana, which occurs north of those mountains and further afield. Another, another undescribed species we have from the Southern Cape is this one on the screen over here. We've nicknamed this one Harpactera sp. George because it occurs in that part of the Southern Cape from around from, from George to Plett, um, possibly uh, 
westwards to Mossel Bay as well. Um, it's a species that often gets mistaken for Harpactera atra because it's got quite a dark coloration to it as well. It's a very dark brown or dark gray species. However, it differs from atra in a number of respects. The most obvious being that it's got this distinctive golden coloration on the carapace and the legs, um, golden CT on the, on the abdomen as well. Um, very scattered and sparse, um, but quite distinct once you, once you notice it. Um, it seems like it's a little bit variable as well. We have populations on the western side of the distribution around Mossel Bay, which are starting to look um, a little bit like a brown Caffrariana, but um, we're not sure if it's all one species or not. There might be more than one species involved, or it might just be a whole lot of variation. Um, it, it's something that uh, needs a little bit more investigation. So this is a female on the screen over here. And here we have the male. Again, quite noticeable golden coloration on the carapace and the legs. Um, this specimen is from the western side of the distribution. Uh, specimens from further east are much darker. So let's have a look at a couple of virtual museum records. This is a record submitted to us by Robert Adams. In this, in this image you can see just how darkly colored the species can be. But again, those light brown patches on the carapace and the, the, the sort of brownish colored abdomen. This is a nice record of a male submitted to us by Johann Labuskachny. And again, you can see the dark brown coloration on the legs, but still a little bit of um, sort of lighter brown or, or, or um, golden coloration on the carapace and the abdomen. The species has a nice distinct distribution down in the Southern Cape as indicated on the map. If we zoom in on that, it occurs from around Mossel Bay all the way across to around Plettenberg Bay. We're not really sure what limits the distribution. It might occur further west than that um, and possibly a little bit further east as well. But it seems like the Otaniqua Mountains here are basically forming the northern border of the species distribution. It doesn't cross the Otaniqua Mountains and is replaced by other species north of those mountains, like Dictator and Tigrina. The next undescribed species is a member of the Namaquensis group. And this particular species is quite special to our hearts in the project because it's one of the very first undescribed species that we went after and made an effort to collect. We got records of this animal through Facebook. Um, someone got in touch with us and sent us photographs. It looked like nothing that we'd seen before, and off we went to go and try and find out more about them. Um, so overall, this is a very darkly colored spider. It's, it's almost black, but with these golden colored CT on the carapace, so the carapace has a much lighter color. And then this key identifying feature in the female specimens is that the last segments of the front legs are light brown. It really strikes you when you see these spiders. It really stands out well. These are medium-sized spiders. And this is the male here. Again, an absolutely striking spider. It has these black legs, this distinct golden carapace, and golden abdomen. Um, absolutely unmistakable species of spider. The males of the species are active in autumn. Uh, as is the case with uh, many of the other Namaquensis group species. So there is some confusion about the identity of the species. People do see it quite regularly, and it often gets misidentified as Harpactera baviana. Um, in fact, there are large numbers of specimens in one of our museum collections, and those have also been misidentified as baviana. However, once we collected Baviana from the type locality and learned what that species looked like, we were confident that this is, in fact, a separate and distinctive species. That brown coloration on the front legs is absolutely diagnostic. You don't see that in Baviana, and the males don't have that same sort of, uh, that same indistinct starburst on the carapace as what male Baviana have. So quite a special animal, this, and something that we were very pleased to learn about and, uh, and discover as our surveys continued. 
When we initially discovered the species, we thought that it might be quite range-restricted within the Karoo as uh, simply because it wasn't something that we knew about. But as we continued doing surveys, we found that it actually has quite a large distribution. This is the distribution shown on the map here. And just zooming in on that a little bit. It, it occurs from the southern free state, but importantly, it's the, it's the parts of the free state that have Karoo-type vegetation. And it basically tracks the edge of the escarpment all the way to Sutherland. It doesn't occur south of these escarpment mountains in, in other parts of the Karoo. It basically just tracks that region. We also have some records from around Carnarvon. So a really nice, discrete, distinct distribution for the species. The last undescribed species we're going to look at is this one here. Also a very darkly co colored species. We've nicknamed this one Harpactera sp prisca uh, because that's where I first learned of, his, learned of its existence but it's actually quite widely distributed in the Northern Cape province. Um, the distinguishing features of this species is that it's small, again, slightly bigger than a typical Harpacterella, um, but the key thing is that it's very dark in color, basically black, sometimes with a lighter carapace as well. For the female, we're going to have a look at a record submitted to us by Alta Liebenberg, um, who lives in the Northern Cape and sees, the, sees these quite readily. And here is the female over here. Something else that's distinctive about the species is that it, ha it has quite long slender legs. It's, it's a relatively slender looking species. Uh, the patterning on the abdomen is also quite distinctive. And um, once you get an eye for this particular species, it's actually easy to recognize. So here is the distribution in the Northern Cape. This particular species occurs from west of Kimberley across to Uppington and Ochrabis. Um, we know that it occurs a little bit further uh, west of that, as well as a bit further south of that at, uh, at Prisca, um, but essentially um, a nice discrete distribution in the Northern Cape for the species. The next group of spiders we're going to look at is a group where we've included the genus Harpacterella as well as Trichognatella. Uh, we've included these two groups together because the taxonomic boundaries within this group are really not clear. Um, we're not even convinced that Harpacterella is actually one, uh, one genus. These are all relatively small baboon spider species. Typically the leg span is four to six centimeters in length, and we generally call them lesser baboon spiders. They vary in coloration from light to dark brown, sometimes even black. Sometimes the species have got quite bright markings on them. Uh, sometimes they're uniform in color, so generally very variable. There also appear to be several new species. Um, it looks like it's a very diverse group of spiders. Again, something that desperately needs taxonomic revision. Here, we're just going to look at what we've identified as the main species groups. So we're not going to be covering all of the species because there's so much uncertainty about what the species boundaries are. Um, but we're hoping by looking at the main groups, um, you'll be able to get um, at least a preliminary identification on any specimens you might see. So an important identification feature in this group of spiders is the presence or absence of scopulae on the outside of the chelicerae. So with Harpactera, we've got scopulae on the outside and on the inside of the chelicerae. With the other big spider genera like uh, Orchocephalus and Keratogyrus and Idiotheli they, and Pteranoculus, they only have scopulae on the outside of the chelicerae, nothing on the inside. Now, in this group of spiders, it starts to get a little bit messy. In the genus that we call Harpacterella, um, they don't have any scopulae on the outside or on the inside of the chelicerae. So there are no scopulae at all. Um, same thing with Brachianopus. Brachianopus has no scopulae on the outside or on the inside of the chelicerae. In Trichognatella and the Karoo group, of um, Harpacterella species, things start to get a little bit more complicated. So Trichognatella shonlandi has got scopulae on the outside and on the inside of the chelicerae. Um, however, those scopulae are 
uh, different to what we see in Harpactera, in that the CT that make up those scopuli have a different structure. Um, so it's, it starts getting quite technical. You have to look at it with a microscope to tell them apart. Um, but we're also seeing Karoo group Harpactorella, which have um, scopuli either on the inside or on, on the outside um, of the, of the chelicerae. So it all gets a little bit complex. And like I said, that's what's adding to the confusion um, in this group of spiders. This is the distribution that we have for these spiders so far. And, um, and you can see it's actually disjunct with a group up here in the northeastern part of the country. In a moment, you'll see what that is. And then the rest of the species all occurring down here um, in the Cape and the Karoo and into southern Namibia. The first member of this group that we're going to take a look at is Harpactorella overdeki. This is an absolutely unique species within the genus. It's a overall brown colored spider. Um, it varies from sort of medium through to dark brown in color, but it is absolutely unmistakable when you learn to recognize it. Firstly, the females have a indistinct starburst on the carapace. But the key identifying feature is that they have these light longitudinal stripes on the patella. So, so basically here on the spider's knees, they look like the, they've got these distinctive two stripes running down the length of the knee. So very, very distinctive for this particular species. Here's the spider viewed from above where you can see that indistinct uh, starburst on the, on the carapace. It's also got this mottled coloration on the abdomen, which is quite distinctive. Um, the legs are relatively short. It looks, it looks similar to a Brachianopus in overall um, profile, um, but not quite as short and stocky as a Brachianopus species. But the really key thing is those stripes on the knees. This is a male specimen that was photographed in the wild recently. Again, you can see the indistinct starburst on the carapace. Um, unfortunately, this specimen has got a regenerated leg and pedipalp on its right side here. But again, on the left side, you can see the knees with these distinct longitudinal stripes. And lastly, just to show another photo of a male, this is a record submitted to us on the Virtual Museum by Andrea Myberg. Um, it's got some nice photos. So in this particular specimen, the starburst is less clearly distinct. But again, you can see these pale stripes on the, um, on the spider's patella, making the identification clear. Now, remarkably for a species as unique and distinct as this, it was only described in 2010 in this paper by Richard Gallen. What makes this species so unique is that it has absolute bizarre um, genital morphology in the males and females. So, so males have this very distinct broad, flat mating bulb, unlike any other uh, mating bulb for uh, any other baboon spider that we have in the region. This is a drawing of the internal genital structure of the female called the spermatheca. This is what the male inserts his mating bulb into when the specimen, when the spiders mate. And it's, it's one large fused uh, sort of half moon shaped disc. Again, completely different to anything that we have in any other South African baboon spiders, including any of the other Harpactorella species. The behavior of the species is also quite distinctive within this group of spiders. Um, they live under rocks where they make these extensive, messy silk retreats. And again, that's quite different to what we see in Brachianopus, uh, which make a, a sort of a small little pocket um, under a rock which they, uh, which they, which they line with silk. Or, or the other Harpactorella, which, which actually live in open burrows. So again, overall, a very unique species. The adult males are active from early summer through until autumn. And here is its distribution. This is the species that occurs up in the northeastern part of South Africa. It's the one that you saw on the previous map of the distribution for the whole uh, group, the Harpactorella tricognatella group. It's the only species that occurs in this part of the country all of the other species occur down uh, in the Cape and in, and in Namibia. And it has quite a wide distribution in this part of the world. So if we look at it a bit more closely, it occurs from around Barberton and the southern parts of the Lowfelt and extends through 
uh, into the northern parts of Limpopo province. Um, it occurs in Sekakuna land as well. Um, so, so relatively widely distributed species, um, quite widely distributed actually in this part of the world. The next part of this Harpacterella tricognitella group we're going to look at is a group of species um, from the southwestern Cape. Um, it includes Harpacterella trilevenae, Harpacterella helenae, and Harpacterella domicola. Um, again, this is a group of spiders where we're not quite sure what's going on, but they're all darkly colored Harpacterella species that occur down in the southwestern part of the Cape. This is Harpacterella trilevenae that we have on the screen over here, an adult female specimen. You can see the very dark coloration. These spiders are, are sort of uh, dark gray or, or dark brown in color. They, there's some lighter CT on the, on the abdomen and sometimes on the carapace as well. This is Harpacterella helenae, which occurs further up the west coast, and you can see the similarity between, between the two species. Having a look at some males, uh, we're going to look at virtual museum records for the males. This is a record submitted to us by Candace Van Dam. And here again, you can see the overall dark coloration. In fact, the males are, are, are pretty close to black uh, in coloration and, uh, and quite distinctive in that they're, they're small in size with this, with this black coloration. This is another record of a specimen that was photographed at night on a walk by Dwayne Evans. And here again, you can see that dark uh, coloration, the specimen having lost uh, two of its legs. So people sometimes have a hard time telling Harpactera atra, the big uh, black Cape boon spider species, um, uh, from these smaller Harpacterella species. Um, but the key thing that you can use there to tell them apart is the presence or absence of scopulae on the outside of the chalicerae. And then obviously the size um, is, is uh, different as well. And, um, and again, looking at the, um, just having a look at the males, um, male, um, male Harpacterella don't have the red hairs on the abdomen. Um, they're a little bit more leggy. They're obviously smaller than Atra males. And um, you can't see it on this image, but they have little distinctive spines on their back legs as well, um, which are not as apparent in Harpactera. This is the distribution, and you can see here the artifact of how we're actually identifying these spiders at the moment. Um, three distinct clusters of spiders, and that's because we're identifying specimens that are um, down close to Cape Town, as Harpacterella trilevenae, and we identify specimens from St. Helena and Saldana, those areas, as Helenae. This little cluster over here is um, Harpacterella domicola from uh, the Breda River Valley. We actually, th these are museum records, we actually only have one virtual museum record uh, for the species that we've received, and it's something that we would like to investigate further and try and get more a new material form. But basically, um, these spiders here on the west coast, um, they're, they're around Cape Town on the peninsula, and they basically track the west coast all the way up to, um, up to Felt Drift and St. Helena Bay, and they go even further as far as Irlands Bay. Um, we've got some records up there which are not actually shown on this map. And, um, and again, one, possibly one species, maybe more than one species, um, but that needs further investigation. Sticking with Harpacterella species from the Western Cape, the next one we're looking at is Harpacterella light footy. This is an adult male on the screen over here, and you can see it's very much lighter in color than the species we just looked at, the Trilevenae and Helenae group of species. Um, it has a distinct starburst on the carapace, a golden starburst on the carapace. The rest of the spider is, is light brown in color, but also important if you look at the markings on the carapace, you can see this coloration comes right up to the eyes. There's no black marking over the eyes, no black mask over the eyes at all. Also important for recognizing males of this species is that the ends of the legs are darker in coloration than the rest of the legs. So it looks like it's got these dark gray feet. This is a record of a female specimen that was submitted to us by Narina Jordan. The photo quality is not fantastic, but you can still make it out quite nicely. Very nice, distinct starburst on the carapace, 
no black mask over the eyes, and the, and the overall light brown or almost golden brown coloration that the species has. Now there's another species described from the Western Cape as well, called uh, a little bit further north in the Western Cape, called uh, Harpacterella longipes. And um, here we're not really sure what the relationship is between that species and, um, and Lightfooty, um, and they may well be synonymous with each other. Um, again, this is something else that needs to be looked at in more detail. Males are active uh, from autumn through into winter. And the species can be quite common where it occurs. If you do find a population, you tend to find lots of individuals. In terms of behavior, the species makes nice round burrows in the open, in, tends to be in uh, areas of, with, uh, with flat ground. This is the distribution range of Harpacterella lightfooty. And if we zoom in on that, you can see it occurs um, in the Western Cape, in this region north of Stellenbosch, um, it's, it's typically called the Swartland. Um, there's a huge amount of uh, wheat farming in this area, so the species has lost a large amount of habitat uh, to farming activities, but it's basically on these plains to the west of the Cape Fold Mountains. The next group of species that we have here is what we've called the Karoo group of Harpacterella. Uh, we've actually made the decision to include Tripognatella in this for now, uh, because it's so similar to so many of these other um, species. On the screen here, you get a sense of the variety that we see within this group. There are, there are a handful of described species like Harpacterella caruica and Harpacterella schwarzi, um, but there really is tremendous diversity, and, um, and again, this is something that needs to be looked at in quite a lot of detail to work out what's going on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, things like Tricognatella shonlandi have got scopulae on the outside and on the inside of the chelicerae, but we have other members in this group which either, which sometimes have it only only between the chelicerae or no scopulae on the chelicerae at all. The distinctive thing about these spiders is that they all um, that they, they they have sort of a dark base color, and then they have these starburst patterns on the carapace as well. So so a golden or yellow starburst on the carapace some yellow coloration on the abdomen, and some yellow coloration on the legs as well. They all have distinctive behavior also in that they make very distinct round vertical burrows um, that, they, that they live in. Um, we surveyed quite extensively um, in the Karoo for the Karoo Biogaps project a few years ago, and, um, and it seems as though they tend to prefer um, habitats along drainage lines where you've got uh, flat silty soil um, that seems to be where you find them quite uh, quite regularly or most often um, and they can be quite abundant in some of those habitats as well um, but here we think that there's probably a lot of undescribed diversity and um, and it's another group that really needs some some thorough investigation in terms of the distribution of this particular group it's what we saw on the map earlier as occurring throughout most of the Karoo and into southern Namibia as well. Um, this map is a little bit more sparse than the original map we showed for the whole group, and that's just because um, our identifications are a little bit all over the place still. Um, however, what we have here is um, species spread throughout the Karoo. Um, Tricognatella is or Tricognatella shonlandi is down here in the Eastern Cape. It's this little cluster of records here um, to the west of Grahamstown. And then we have a Harpacterella magna record close to Port Elizabeth as well. And then these records here in northern Namaqualand are um, what we call Harpacterella spinosa. And then we've got other members of this group um, throughout southern Namibia also. Those all are completely unknown to us um, and, and very, very poorly uh, uh, collected and surveyed in, in that part of the world. The one member of this group that I would like to draw your attention to is this cluster of records here, um, sort of in the, in the eastern part of the Northern Cape. This is an undescribed species that we have in this group, and it's quite distinctive. So this is it, an undescribed Harpacterella species from the Northern Cape. It's quite dark in color, 
again with lighter coloration on the carapace. But the distinctive feature for the species is that the ends of the legs have these distinct orange coloration that stands out from the dark color on the legs. This is a male in this photo. And this is the same specimen in a defensive posture and here you can really see how that orange stands out against the rest of the leg. A very, very um, attractively marked little baboon spider species. And here we have the female. So here we can see that um, coloration that's quite characteristic for this group of spiders. The dark base coloration with the lighter starburst on the carapace, lighter markings on the abdomen. And again, we have this nice orange coloration on the ends of the legs as well. The next genus we're going to have a look at is Idiotheli, or the trapdoor baboon spiders. These spiders can be identified by a handful of key features. The first one is that the carapace of these spiders is distinctly round in shape. Here we have a female, and you can see the roundness of that carapace. Here again, in a male, a very distinctly round carapace. But a very useful feature is that these spiders have an all-black underside, as you can see in this photo. They vary quite a lot in coloration. Some have this kind of silvery gray coloration like you see in this specimen with a very distinct starburst on the carapace. Uh, but in some forms, particularly, particularly the males of particular forms, the spider can be all black. An interesting feature about idiotheli is that the juveniles are quite pale in color and can actually be orange in color. If we have a look at this record here, submitted to us by Len de Beer from Mozambique, we can see that coloration nicely in this particular individual. It's a very small juvenile specimen photographed in Mozambique. When they're very young like this, the black coloration on the underside can be less distinct and it only starts to develop when they are older. But if you look carefully in the young specimens, there is like a, a grayish tinge to the underside, um, indicative of that black coloration that will develop later on. As the name suggests, these spiders build a trapdoor on their burrow entrance, which is, which is camouflaged with the surrounding substrate, making them incredibly difficult to find during the day. Um, people don't see these spiders very often during the day and you might and 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 they might seem to be rare uh, in the areas where they're found um, but these spiders are actually quite widely distributed in the northern parts of southern Africa and they're seen quite often particularly the males are seen often moving around at night uh, when they're active they occur in a wide range of habitats um, from savannas through to grasslands. They also occur on different soil types. So you, we get them on sandy soils in some areas and quite clay soils in others. They don't seem to be particular to any specific soil type. There are only two species currently recognized in this genus and the first one we're going to look at is the common trapdoor baboon spider, Idiotheli nigrofulva. This is a female again here on the screen uh, again with that distinctive grayish coloration, nice starburst on the carapace, and so on. Idiotheli nigrofulva is a medium-sized to large species of baboon spider. They're typically silvery gray like this, but you also get specimens uh, that are completely black in coloration. So this is a female from uh, the eastern parts of South Africa, and you can see it's slightly different in overall appearance to the one in the previous image. This is a male from northern KwaZulu-Natal. This particular form is, is uh, quite distinctive. They have the starburst on the carapace. They have these dark femurs on the legs. And then the rest of the leg is uh, beige in color. So they are very distinctive. But you also get males that look like this. Very, very dark in coloration with these white joints on the legs. And... Um, they still fall within the same species, uh, Idiotheli nigrofulva. The males have a very distinct activity period, being active from around November through to January. So it's typically a summer active species, which is quite different to our other baboon spiders, which tend to be active in autumn or spring. 
Having a look at the distribution, this is a widely distributed species. They occur from the central parts of the country here, up into Limpopo province, and down again into northern KwaZulu-Natal. There's, we find them in central KwaZulu-Natal as well, but to be honest, we think this needs further investigation because these might actually be a different species. From South Africa, they extend up into Zimbabwe, essentially occurring throughout Zimbabwe, and we have records from eastern Botswana as well. And then we have records in Namibia too, and we think that they probably occur throughout Botswana and into northern Namibia, but the lack of sampling in this region, uh, the sort of more arid regions of western Botswana and uh, the sparsely populated areas of eastern Namibia is probably why we don't have records there. So a very widely distributed species indeed. The second species we have is Idiotheli mira, the so-called blue-footed baboon spider. These spiders look just like the nigra fulva with the distinct starburst on the carapace and the, ba the pale beige legs, but they have these blue feet, which is, very, which, which is the key identifying feature for this species. Here is the same spider photograph from the front, and here you can see that those blue markings on the legs quite distinctly. So can't be confused with nigrofulva if you're looking for the blue markings on the legs. We're not going to show the distribution for the species because it's another one that's in high demand for the pet trade, but it occurs in northern KwaZulu-Natal and it, uh, it does actually occur uh, in sympatry with Idiotheli nigrofulva as well. We don't have an image of a female to show you here, but the females are overall very similar to the male that you see here and also have those distinctive blue markings on the feet. The last genus we're looking at is Pteranoculus. This is the dominant baboon spider genus in East and Central Africa. They are medium to large size babo baboon spiders. Um, coloration is typically brown or, or gray, uh, some shade of gray. And what's interesting about this group of baboon spiders is they show wide variety of behavior in terms of the, um, the way that they live and the types of retreats that they actually live in. Members of this genus are most likely to be confused with the genus Hopactera. They both have nice distinct scopulae on the outside of the chelicerae, but Pteranoculus lack the scopula in between the chelicerae. They can also be separated on distribution, uh, with Pteranoculus being predominantly occurring uh, in East Africa and only, get, only just getting into South Africa, whereas you saw the distribution of Harpactera, which is predominantly South African and uh, with the most diversity down in the Cape provinces. So here we have the distribution of this genus in Africa, and as you can see, it's very widely distributed. It occurs, it occurs from Ethiopia and South Sudan in the north, basically just south of the Sahara, and extends all the way down into northern Namibia, northern Botswana, and we have a couple of species that get into the northern parts of South Africa as well. But most of the diversity of this genus is in East Africa, um, where it seems to be the dominant uh, baboon spider genus. And the first species we're going to look at in this genus is Pteranoculus murinus, this spider that we have on the screen here. This is a ubiquitously distributed species in East Africa, and it's very distinct, very easy to recognize once you know what to look for. Uh, the legs are dark gray in color, and they have these distinctive white bands um, on the leg joints, um, absolutely uh, distinctive. Also important is that there's no distinct starburst on the carapace. Instead, the carapace is light in color, um, but overall it's a very dark brown spider so this is a female in this photograph here. You can actually see the scopulae on the sides of her chelicerae here really nicely. Pteranoculus tend to have very well-defined scopulae on the sides of the, uh, on the chelicerae. And then just moving across, we have the male over here. So again, basically the same as the female, dark gray legs, white joints on the legs, except that we see a more uh, distinctive um, although still subtle starburst pattern on the carapace of the spider, like you see here.
These spiders are very large. They are amongst our largest baboon spiders, and um, they can have a leg span of up to 12 centimeters or more in length. And what's, and what's unique about this species is that it lives in trees. It's arboreal. Here we have a photograph of a retreat of one of these spiders. This is photographed in the wild. Um, they make these uh, this sort of messy uh, silk, um, th this messy silk webbing over the ent over the entrance of a tree hole um, or some other cavity uh, in trees, and the spider then lives in that tree hole. Very distinct, very easy to see. Um, interesting in this photo is that you can actually see millipede rings, um, which are which are old prey remains. The spider had actually fed on a millipede, and we see those rings in the um, uh, in the left in the silk over here. So these spiders don't only live in trees, they also live um, in walls or um, sometimes in houses, in, in buildings where they make their silk retreats on roofs um, or in holes in walls. And we have some really great records submitted to us from Malawi by Gary Brown that illustrates this behavior. Here is a juvenile specimen where you can see that the retreat is made in the hole um, between bricks in a wall. So this really is one of our special baboon spider species um, because it's our only arboreal species that we have in southern Africa and also because it's so distinctive in appearance. It's common, people see it a lot, and it has a very large distribution. Basically through, throughout East Africa, in the southern African region, we basically just see them here in northern Zimbabwe and then coming down a little bit further south in Mozambique, um, we actually have records as far south as, um, as Inyamban. We have one record here in Angola. Um, Angola is generally poorly sampled for baboon spiders, and we're relatively confident that the species is more widely distributed in that country. The last record that's worth pointing out is this record here um, in the Sotpansberg region of South Africa up in, up in Limpopo province. This is a published record for the species. Uh, the, the, the specimens are in um, the Ditsong Museum of Natural History in Pretoria, um, but we think that it's possible or, or, or actually quite likely um, that there was a mistake with the locality details uh, for these specimens and that the species doesn't actually occur in South Africa. Um, and that's also... we. The Baboon Spider Atlas team has been to that area several times now and searched quite extensively and not been able to locate these spiders. The males are active in midsummer, so typically we see them in November, December, January. The next species we're going to have a look at is Pteranoculus cryptus, this spider in the photograph here. We were very privileged to be able to get specimens of this. The species is limited to desert habitats in the southwestern parts of Angola only. And basically this spider looks like a small, hairy variety of Pteranoculus murinus. It's also gray in color, although it's not as dark gray. Um, it's got no distinct starburst on the carapace. But it's also got this very sort of hairy, fluffy appearance to it, which is quite distinct. It's a small species of Pteranoculus. Probably about, probably about 8 centimeter leg span, um, seems to be one of the smallest members of the genus, and, and obviously specialized in some way for living in those very arid environments in southwestern Angola. Um, it lives under rocks where it makes a messy silk retreat. Um, it doesn't actually make a, a burrow for itself um, as many other baboon spider species do. We know very little about the species. We don't know when the adults, when the adult males are active in the wild, and we haven't actually been able to get females. We've only got males, like the specimen in the photo. The next species we're looking at, our special South African Pteranoculus, is Pteranoculus lapalala. This is a dark grey spider. The juveniles have some yellowish coloration to the carapace and the abdomen as well. Um, it's quite a leggy species of Pteranoculus, and, um, and it also has quite specialized habitat requirements. This is the adult female over here. You can see again this nice dark gray coloration that they have on the legs. No white bands on the, on the leg joints or anything like that. Um, there's an indistinct, very indistinct starburst on the carapace. 
and you can see how nicely these cholesterol scopuli stand out on the sides of the cholesterol there. And here we have the adult male, pretty much the same as the adult female, except maybe just a little bit more hairy, which is quite typical for, male, for, for adult male baboon spiders. But as I said, the species has quite specialized habitat requirements. Um, they occur in very rocky habitats, and it seems as though they prefer areas with a particular geology type, where you get, so, so um, they're, on, they're on sandstone geologies, but it seems to be where the sandstone has a particular dark purple coloration to it. That's where we find these guys, and we don't find them in other, uh, in other rocky habitats close by. What these spiders do is they find a relatively flat rock to live under, and they go in under that and make a, a messy uh, silk retreat like this. And you can see here there's a shed skin uh, in the top of the, of the spider's retreat over here. There's another older shed skin off to the, the right-hand side here. And behind this shed skin in the silk retreat, you can actually see the spider sitting um, under the, uh, uh, in the burrow like that. So some other important features about the spider is that it's, it's quite a slender, leggy species. And if you look at them from the side, they've got quite a compressed body shape, which we think is an adaptation to living under these flat rocks where you find them. Adult males are active in autumn. So here is the distribution range in South Africa. As I said, it's a South African special endemic to the northeastern part of the country. And if we zoom in on that distribution range, it seems to be limited to the northern parts of the Waterberg Mountains. These are the Waterberg Mountains over here, and the records that we have are all on the northern part of those mountains. Okay, then moving on to the burrowing species of Pteranoculus. We're going to have a look at two in this video. The first one is this spider here, Pteranoculus vorax. It's a dark brown species of baboon spider with lighter CT on the body, but overall it has a dark but dark brown appearance to it. This is a female in the photo over here, and this is what the male looks like. The male has a more distinct starburst on the carapace, and again, overall dark brown coloration. But the distinctive identifying features for this species are as follows. Firstly, the male has this distinct swollen tibia on the third leg. So this segment over here is really nice and swollen relative to the rest of the leg. And the second feature is the shape of this metatarsus of the first leg. So the second last segment of the first leg, and you can see how strongly curved that is, and then straightens out towards the end. Here is his tibial spur, and so you can see how this curvature um, opposes the tibial spur. And again, this is for wrapping around the female's chalicerae when he engages with her uh, using that tibial spur. So those two features together are important for identifying this particular species. And here we have the distribution range, quite widely distributed across the central parts of Africa here. Um, most of this is outside of the, the area that we're looking at for this project. But we're interested in the distribution within Zambia. Essentially occurs throughout the central parts of Zambia, and we have some records that we are now certain are the species as well from the Caprivi strip in Namibia. So quite widely distributed within this particular part of the world. And here we have the last species of Pteranoculus and the last species of baboon spider that we're including in this video, Pteranoculus lugardi. It's closely related to Vorax, uh, the one that we previously looked at. However, it's most easily differentiated from that species uh, based on coloration, where Lugardi is light brown or beige in color like this, whereas Vorax is dark brown in color. This is a female Lugardi specimen in the photo here, originally source, sourced from the pet trade and so likely to have originated from, uh, from East Africa. And this is a South African female here. Again, light brown coloration. However, this specimen has um, a slightly more distinctive uh, starburst on the carapaces uh, compared to what the, what the previous one had. And here we have the male. Again, he has relatively light coloration on his legs, light brown or beige legs and abdomen, 
His carapace is a little bit darker, but with the light uh, markings on the carapace, a very, very indistinct starburst here. Um, he also has the same uh, swollen tibia on the third leg as what we see in Pteranoculus vorax, but another important feature for telling those two species apart is that in Lugardi, the metatarsus, the second last segment of the first leg, is straight, whereas it's got that distinct curvature to it that we saw in Vorax. An interesting behavior of the species is that they make a trapdoor lid on their burrows just the same way that idiotheli do. This was a surprise to us when we first found these spiders in South Africa. We were not expecting a Pteranocula species to be making a trapdoor on its burrow, but that's what the species does. It can be reliably distinguished from idiotheli though by looking at the underside of the spider which is light in color as in this photo as opposed to having that all black underside that we see in idiotheli. The adult males are active in autumn. And lastly looking at the distribution again it appears to be a widely distributed species of Pteranoculus occurring from northern Namibia through northern Botswana it seems, it seems to occur through most of Zimbabwe into northern South Africa. And then we have these records in Tanzania as well. No records in between. However, we think that that's most likely to be because of the species cryptic behavior um, and the fact that it's probably poorly sampled in these regions as a result. Um, and more sampling is needed to actually work out where it occurs. So thank you for watching our video. I hope that you found it informative and that you've learned something about identifying baboon spiders. Um, please remember to contribute records, get involved, get out there to those interesting areas and let's see what other interesting baboon spiders we have in this region. And lastly, again, just a reminder to subscribe to the channel, like the video and share it with your friends.